Congo. Huge, dark, straddling the equator in the very heart of Africa. Untamed, uncompromising and unreported until now. A deadly shootout in Congo's capital, Kinshasa. In a city which often lives by the gun, this is just another day. As rival militias slug it out on the streets, two men were battling at the ballot box for the presidency. This man won. The first priority is peace and stability. But the loser claimed his rival rigged the vote. Que je ne peux pas accepter ces résultats. Dangerous words in a volatile country like Congo, especially when renegade warlords are stirring the pot. We are in a good position to win this war. But the real losers, millions of battle-weary Congolese, the poorest of people living in potentially the richest country on earth. It's a circle of vicious poverty that I don't know how you can get out of. This is Congo's story. It's suffering and the struggle for democracy. Hello, I'm John Cookson in Kinshasa. In October, millions of Congolese went to the polls to vote for their first democratically elected president in more than 40 years of chaos and war. In the first half of this program, we look at the grave issues facing the leadership of this extraordinary country. One of the biggest challenges is Congo is awash with weapons. You can buy an AK-47 for just 10 US dollars. The Congolese say you can start a war here for 500. It felt like someone had when we began making this film. We were at the headquarters of presidential candidate Jean-Pierre Bemba when all hell broke loose. The building was suddenly under attack from rockets and bullets. Four people were killed this day. Four more to add to the four million who've already died in Congo's recent conflicts. And we don't know what happened to these two. They were caught outside Bemba's headquarters and accused of spying. We soon understood Congo can be a brutal place. After the issue of violent political division, the second challenge for Congo is the country's extreme poverty and lack of infrastructure. Congo's big, the size of Western Europe, Paved roads are rare and simple journeys can take days. Millions of Congolese live without running water and electricity. And yet, and here's the irony, Congo's potentially very rich. Its vast, unexploited mineral wealth like diamonds and gold, estimated at $23 trillion. But that wealth is both a blessing and a curse. For decades, rival warlords battled to secure control of the mines. The brutal civil war between 1998 and 2002 drew in neighboring countries like Uganda and Rwanda. Now the conflict's over, but not the grinding poverty suffered by Congolese working in the mines today. None more so than at La Folie gold mine in the far northeast. It was named La Folie from the French word for madness. Locals told me anyone who worked here for long eventually loses their mind. Uh, 
Mud sucks at their feet. Muscles are torn by the sheer weight of muck and slurry. They have to shift a chunk of mountain to find a few grains of gold. No gold and they don't get paid. This youngster told me he earns the equivalent of 35 US cents a day, if he's lucky. He says, this is my life doing this, there's nothing else. Close by, we discovered an illegal gold mine running deep underground. Congolese poor virtually live down here in this stinking, flooded and dangerous labyrinth. The only light from candles and their own flashlights. This young miner, who said he was 15, was supporting his entire family after his father died. As his fellow miners listened, you could see the despair and hopelessness. While they toil below for just a few US cents a day, On the surface, it's a different story. In sleazy gold towns like Mungwalu, business is booming. The gold the miners broke their backs for is already trading at 20 US dollars a gram. By the time it's been smuggled out through neighboring Uganda to markets like London, the price will have soared again. A sum unimaginable by the miners of La Folie, who seem to epitomize the enigma of Congo. Such a rich country, yet the wealth earned by the sweat of its poorest people ends up in the hands of smugglers, foreign governments and corporations. Some Congolese families are so poor they can't afford to feed their children. And in despair they come to United Nations feeding centers. Each month, nuns here in Goma feed around 4,000 babies, including Vanessa, 12 months old, born in mineral-rich Congo, and still she starves. The World Food Programme's Aya Schneerson. How come we have this scandal here? That's the biggest contradiction um, and the saddest thing about it, that this country is so rich and yet the people are so poor, they can't even feed themselves. So who's to blame? That's a hard question. It's, it's a question maybe that we can apply to all of Africa, but um, it's a circle of vicious poverty that I don't know how you can get out of. While Congo wrestles with poverty and political instability, there's a third challenge lurking in the forests of the east. Warlords have traditionally ruled this region. Perhaps the most notorious, Laurent Nkunda, who agreed to meet us at a secret jungle hideout. He's wanted for heinous war crimes, there's an arrest warrant for his capture and transportation to the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Why they can bring me to The Hague? It's not a solution. Let's talk solution. about those allegations. I mean, when I read them, they turned my stomach. You know, I, I even felt as if I would be uncomfortable sitting with you here now. You are charged with murder, torture, massacre. These are terrible, even cannibalism of your guys. I think what it's not true. Say, it is not true. You are in our area. If you want, you can move and see the population. They are going to give you... He denied all the charges and claimed he'd struck a deal with the new president not to be handed over to face trial in return for maintaining an iron grip on the east. I'm not a threat against the population of Congo because we are the, our area is the most secured area. We are not a, a threat against the international policies. But within days of this interview, Nkunda's men were advancing on the city of Goma and were only halted when United Nations forces moved in. Laurent Nkunda is clearly a serious challenge to the rule of law in Congo's emerging democracy.
country racked with violence and political division, people crippled by poverty, these are the challenges facing Congo's newly re-elected president. Coming up, I actually meet President Joseph Kabila in his first and only television interview following his landslide win. Why do you think you're a fit and proper person to run a united Congo? Welcome back, I'm John Cookson in Kinshasa. In the first half of the programme, we looked at the grave issues facing this country, like continuing violence and desperate poverty. Now we meet the man whose job it is to turn it all around and bring peace to this troubled land. We met at Congo's National Palace, a building still physically dominated by his father, Laurent Kabila, who was assassinated in 2001. His murder thrust 29-year-old Joseph Kabila into the top job. At the time, he was the world's youngest head of state. I'd read he was shy, awkward in public, ill at ease in interviews. But the man I met was thoughtful, articulate, and meticulously planning Congo's future. Well, the first priorities are, are quite clear. The first priority is peace and stability. Peace and stability uh, throughout the country. Uh, peace and stability which will bring about uh, the necessary investments, the necessary investors that we need to create, to create jobs, uh, to create the wealth that we need for, for, for our people and uh, to make it such that people can move again freely from uh, east to west, from north to south, across the whole country. Kabila is popular in Congo's east, but loathed in the west of the country, including the capital Kinshasa. It's here political rival Bemba, a former warlord, has his power base. Initially, he refused to accept the presidential election result, which he lost by two and a half million votes. Que je ne peux pas accepter ces résultats, qui sont loin de refléter la vérité des urnes. Bemba alleged vote rigging, but eventually accepted the result after Congo's Supreme Court rejected his appeal. But this acceptance did nothing to breach the deep political division, which still splits the country. Why do you think? you're a fit and proper person to run a united Congo? Well, depends. It's, it's a point of view. Uh, why am I the proper and fit person to run a, a, a united, united Congo? Well, the Congo, the Congo was reunited by, by the same person who is, uh, who is sitting uh, face to face with you. The Congo three years ago, 2003, as we signed the peace agreement, was a divided country. That country is no longer the, the same Congo that we knew in 2003. It's now a united Congo. I 
I raised the serious issue of Congo being awash with weapons. Earlier we joined a United Nations patrol on Lake Albert on Congo's eastern border. Lake Albert forms part of the international boundary with Uganda and is a major arms smuggling route. Every year, tons of guns and other weapons are spirited clandestinely across this 200 kilometer long waterway. Any one of these fishermen could be smuggling weapons. It's hard work because outboards often have to be dragged through sometimes shallow water. Hazardous too because armed smugglers simply melt into the swampland community, according to Commander Alexandros Barrios. It's dangerous because you, you never know the real situation. Uh, you know, the militia can mix between among the local people. The UN Marines mount 24-hour patrols, but only have enough resources to police three quarters of the lake. Smugglers simply take another route and avoid the patrols. Commander Fernando Tomi spoke of his frustrations. This is a very difficult area because, uh, as you see, as you can see, it's, it's very, we, we can be all, all, all uh, bad guys can, can open fire on, on, on our rubber boats. It's, it's very easy to open fire from the, from the coast, you know. Yeah. And we are patrolling here. We are uh, very much vulnerable here, operating here very close to the coast. We are very interested to, to catch some, some weapons uh, to show the community that, that, that we are uh, useful here. So despite the vigilance of patrols like this, the guns and bullets still get through. A matter I raised with the president. We have what we call uh, the joint commission, which is based in fact in Kisangani, which has been working, and it will continue to to uh, to be very active. That commission. But Mr. President, the, the objective today, of today, sir. Today, sir, I know gold is being smuggled out. Weapons are coming in. You're not getting to grips with it. We had, and we still have priorities. Priority number one in this country was to reunify the country. The country was divided. You don't go after gold smugglers when the country is divided. Priority number one. Priority number two was to stabilize the situation, bring about peace and security. We're doing that. Priority number three was to organize elections. We've organized elections. We want to stabilize now the situation, the political situation, in order to give the political leadership that will be put in place, the government and all the other institutions, time to look and take care of the problems that you've raised. We then talked about reigning in renegades within the Congolese army, who still carry out atrocities in remote villages. Again, the UN, which has 17,500 troops in Congo, is lending a hand. This is a boot camp run by Pakistani trainers. Military experts say the Congolese army are excellent fighters and distinguish themselves in war. But in peacetime, maverick soldiers continue to rob, rape and murder innocent villagers, especially in the lawless east. We joined boot camp near the town of Bunia. On the agenda, unarmed combat skills. Bonding, too, is all part of the learning process for these soldiers. They may do well in training, but Congolese soldiers often go for months on end without pay. 
Frustrated, they simply quit the army and drift back to private militias where they earn regular money. And ironically, where they use newfound skills taught to them by the UN. The army, problems of corruption. These are problems that exist, problems that will be tackled. So that's your promise, that the people in the villages, some of the villages that we went to in the east, will no longer have to live in fear, literally, of their lives, of, of men coming into their villages and raping them or, or, or killing the husband and the kids. That's going to stop? Is the, that the, the fear that you saw, the fear that you witnessed, is not the same fear that existed way back in 2001, 2002, 2003. The situation is evolving in a very positive way. And the situation will continue to evolve in a very positive way. And there will be radical change, a lot of changes, in fact. So I'm very confident in the fact that we are on the right path and we are moving in the right direction. So can he mend the broken heart of Africa? After years of turmoil, war and suffering, Joseph Kabila is Congo's best hope yet. No one doubts the mountainous task ahead. Having stabilized the country, he has to start delivering basics like roads, running water and electricity to millions of Congolese. He has to keep an eye on renegade warlords like Laurent Nkunda, who can easily stir trouble in the restive East. He has to find a political niche for the loser in the presidential race, Jean-Pierre Bemba, whose militias can cause mayhem in the capital. We asked the senior United Nations figure in Congo's east, Brigadier Mohamed Maboub, for his assessment of Kabila's kingdom. Do you expect that Mr. Kabila is going to fulfill expectations? He has to depend uh, on his luck and he has to depend on uh, enormous support from outside. Do you think you'll get it? I think the international community will, uh, have, has done so much. I think they will uh, try to help him, help him if uh, he has uh, I'll say, a pragmatic program for development of the people and the country itself. As for Kabila himself, he's convinced Congo has a new beginning. We've turned a page, a page on the history of this country, which has been a country in turmoil for over four decades. And now we're going to restart writing the history of the country. And he's well aware it will be history that will judge him.